Welcome to the Insightful Player Podcast. My name is Chrissy Carew. I'm the host and founder of Insightful Player and the author of Insightful Player Football Pros Lead a Bold Movement of Hope. I partner with NFL players to transform our world to be inclusive, kinder, and more loving. In each episode, I interview NFL players and NFL vets who overcame tremendous obstacles to reach their dream of playing in the NFL. And I'm also a transformational coach. I empower my clients to embrace their dreams, to transform their world in the world around them. And we want you to believe in your dreams and encourage you to commit to them now. Humanity is in trouble. We need you. We all need to do this. We need to embrace our dreams and share them with others so we can have an immediate positive impact on making our world a much kinder place. We invite you to become an important part of our bold movement of hope. Watch this podcast, share it with others, and let us know what you want to see and hear to support you in becoming an insightful player in your life. Thank you. Welcome to the Insightful Player Podcast. I am so excited. We have a very, very special guest on today who I met, I think, in 2010-ish in in, in that ballpark, right? Um, Yeah. And it's Jerome Sapp. Um, he played for the Ravens and the Colts and gosh, and before then he was at Notre Dame and fairly recently he just got his MBA from Harvard. Yeah. He's a c- serial entrepreneur. He's owned three businesses and I'm going to have him share more about that story today with you. And um, he's overcome a lot of obstacles in his life and he's someone that I've learned a lot from. And and you will too. So really, welcome, 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 Jerome. Thanks for having me, Chrissy. It's, it's good seeing you, and it's it's good to be back, a part of the insightful player. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Gosh, we have so much to talk about. I don't know where to begin, but um, you developed some amazing um, skills and characteristics when you were young, like back when you were really really young, and um, sometimes you lost your electricity, so your mom. Um, recommended that you do your homework when it was still light out, just in case. Can you share a little bit about about that time in your life? Sure. You know, growing up to a single mother in, in the fifth ward of Houston, Texas, you know, I knew intimately what a lack of a lot of things were. Um, a lack of electricity sometimes, a lack of running water. Um, but I never had a lack of love and caring from my mother. My father was in prison. And my mother raised my older sister and older brother and I. So to the point you just made, there were times when we'd come home and there wouldn't be electricity in the house simply because my mom had to make a decision to pay another bill, um, like the, the, the rent. Um, and we did without electricity. So the one key thing, though, she was really big on academics. And no matter what the circumstance was, she always taught us that we had to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable because life was going to make you uncomfortable. If it wasn't now, at some point in life, you would have to struggle through something, being uncomfortable. And in those times, she made us do our homework to candlelight. Um, though we didn't have electricity and though, you know, it was it was sometimes frustrating. You know, as a little kid, you don't really understand why the electricity is off, why the water is off. You know, she said, hey, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't matter why it's off. The key thing is that you get your work done and you get it done on time. So candle lights were lit. We had to sit around doing our homework and we turned it in on time. And that that was definitely a life lesson for me and my siblings, for sure. Yeah, I, you know, I love your mother. Um, she did such an amazing job with you and your brother and sister. Uh, I don't know yeah. how I, it's so hard for single women, um, single moms, that rather to bring up the kids by herself. She deserves so much credit. They should Absolutely. have an Academy Awards ceremony for all of them. You know, Absolutely. yeah, there's a lot we can learn from your mom and many other moms like her. Yep. Yeah. So, and you and you had more um, interesting um, situations and experiences in in your childhood when you know you were very embarrassed when you were playing out out playing with your brother and you're playing football and you had food stamps that um, yep. came out of your you had them hidden in your shoe and they came out and you learned some valuable lessons from that even though it wasn't easy at the time. Can you share that story? Yeah, you know that was actually funny. You know, 
we're, we're on our way to the store and we have, we were on food stamps and I remember my brother and I, we couldn't pass up a pickup football game. It was almost like a moth to a flame and we're on our way to the store and, you know, I'd always stuff the food stamps in my, in my, in my, in my shoe, just in case we ran into anyone. And, you know, we, we didn't, if we didn't want to get jacked for our food stamps. Um, so of course we're playing in the game and, I get the ball and I'm running and someone tried to tackle me and my shoe came off and food stamps flew everywhere. And of course, everyone out there was on food stamps. Um, but the fact that my food stamps were, were scattered about everywhere, everyone laughed. <laughs> laughed. So that, that was a learning lesson. I felt so embarrassed by it, but I remember my brother just being like, man, pick your head up, you know, let's pick these food stamps up. Let's go to the store and let's, let's, let's buy what we, what we set out to buy, you know, let's, and getting home, my mom, you know, was just, you, you can't be embarrassed by the circumstances you're in as long as you're always thriving for something better, you know. Her thing to us was always the, the, the world is is bigger than, than, than what it seems, you know. Um, and you're outdoors. The, the things you see right outside of your neighborhood is not the world. The world is way bigger. So if you strive for bigger and you dream bigger, she was really big on reading books, too, because... You can read a book and, and, you know, transplant yourself in another time and another place and really expand your way of thinking about things. So we always strive for better. And that was the message after that food stamp incident. Listen, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed of where you are right now. This is where we are. This is a reality. But also the reality is you're a young man. You're, you're a smart young man and you have the world ahead of you. And as long as you're thinking about the future, you're, you're fine. So, yeah. That's an amazing lesson, right? And I hope kids and, and adults alike, you know, yep. listen to that. And you're much more than your circumstance. And let Absolutely. that motivate um, you like it did you and your brother. Um, yep. Again, I have to salute your mother again. Um, yep. <laughs> and, and there's another incident, um, well, a time in your life when you went to Notre Dame. And um, you talked about how you didn't really have to adjust to the culture. The culture had to adjust to you. And you were yeah. a very, very, very bright student. Um, yeah. and, and everybody, Jerome's very bright and was. Um, and, and some of the people have made some assumptions about you that weren't true um, at Notre Dame. Can you, your study circles, can you share a little yeah. bit about that? Well, you know, I was fortunate. You know, I grew up in a household <laughs> that um, my mom taught us to love everyone and anyone and deal with people as they are, not what you've heard about you know, stereotypes, you know, n none of that, like deal with people as they deal with you, you know, but be empathetic, <clears throat> everyone, because everyone's going through something. And, you know, I grew up, you know, playing chess with, with drug, you know, with dope boys and, and, and ex convicts and, you know, having conversations with them. So I, I knew from the bottom to the top, you know, I could talk with anyone and, Fortunate for us too, my brother and I, we went to a high school that was very, um, it, it was a mixed school. So we were introduced to, to a lot of different nationalities and personalities. So when I got to Notre Dame, you know, I, I knew how to talk to, you know, I knew how to adjust to being at a school where it was 98% white people. Like that didn't bother me. Um, but the funny thing was, as we've talked about, they had to adjust to me because a lot of those <laughs> students had never been around a black person um so the funny part they 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 dealt with you from a stereotypical standpoint like their interactions with you were based on perceived stereotypes for example yeah i remember they were barbecuing in the quad one time and one kid was like hey jerome you know you're black you know how to barbecue right like <laughs> and i remember being like no nah, like just put some meat on the grill and light it up and you're good you know like um but the good thing was i never took never took it personal you know um some of those people i took i took for for example i took those ignorant moments and use it as a chance to educate some of them and to this day a lot of those well not a lot of them some of those students are now some of my good friends and i think it, it was them willing to be open-minded and learn that hey these stereotypes aren't always true and let me open up my mind and actually take the time to learn something from this guy that I don't know nothing about. Um, and, you know, as, as, as a result, like I just mentioned, I still have some of those relationships today um, because they took the time and we took the time to actually speak to one another and say, hey, man, you, 
you, you probably shouldn't go up to someone and assume this, you know, or assume that. And, you know, that that's life, though, right? I mean, I, I wish that's kind of a microcosm of the way the world should be, being open-minded to other people just because they're different or they believe in something different than you. doesn't mean you have to believe it, but the ability to be open-minded and empathetic to the, 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 the reasons behind they do certain things. So, yeah. Uh, that's one of the things that impressed upon me the most when I first met you, how, you know, you felt judged at uh, Notre Dame, but mm -hmm. you didn't go there. And um, you felt empathy. They didn't know better. They hadn't exposed yep. it. And, um, and you, you stood strong in, in your confidence. And, um, and, you, and you cared about them in, in, because they didn't know better. I mean, I admire yep. that so much about you. If we could all be more empathetic, um, yeah. That's a huge missing right now in our world, isn't it, Jerome? Well, it is. And I think the way I grew up, I should say the way I had to grow up, I had to grow up quick. And there were a lot of times when my mom wasn't around, but she raised us to be independent and strong and learn to make good decisions. That was her biggest thing. You know, she gave us a lot of room to make mistakes, but she also trusted us to make the, the right decision, too. Um, so when I got up to school, like I was already strong in myself. I knew who I was um, and I knew where I came from. And a lot of those kids in Ivy League type schools never had to figure out who they were at a young age and have to stand on that, too. Um, so in a funny way, like I looked at them as these insecure individuals that didn't really know who they were to begin with. So how could they really know who I was? You know, so it was an incident where one of my my um, dorm mates had a Confederate flag in their dorm. He was from Mississippi. Oh. And I remember walking by the room and being like, yo, like, what's up with the flag, man? And he was like, well, that's my state flag. Like, and I could tell he, he literally just went over his head. He literally had no, he didn't even know what I was getting at, I think. Long story short, Two days later, I remember him coming to me like crying and being like, I had no idea this was offensive to you. Um, of course, at that point, he took it down, um, but he apologized. And we sat in my room and talked for maybe 45 minutes about what that flag meant. Um, it was a deeper meaning behind it. But once again, Chrissy, you know, in his credit, he took time to really understand from a point of view that he may not ever could understand, but just because he couldn't understand it didn't make it not valid type thing. Um, and him, him and I are actually friends to this day. So those are the type of interactions as we talked about, the empathy, learning how to look at another person. Um, I don't care how different they are. I don't care what their belief system is, um, but at least under trying to understand where they're coming from. And like I said, you may not agree with them. You may never agree with them. Um, but if, if you can talk about something and come to a common ground and look at pe each other as humans and create laws that reflect the world as humans and not just, you know, a statistic or something like that, then I think you get some in this world. Yeah. Uh, that's such a big part of who you are. I think you brought that out in that man, that young, you know, back then. And, and you continue to do that. And yep. that's what we all need to do is be more open and listen, as you said, and understand. Try to understand where they're coming from. Like yep. that fellow didn't even have any idea what that um, flag meant, right? Yep. And, right? And so we need to, you know, really s slow down just like you did and, and have yep. these conversations versus yep. get so defensive, right? Yep. Um, so yep. we, we need you out in front of a lot of people speaking because um, that's such a powerful message, Jerome. It really yep. is. It really yep. is. And uh, your work ethic is through the roof. And, you know, you're unbelievable. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Jerome is a serial entrepreneur. Yep. And um, I'd love for you to share that story, those stories with everybody. Well, I mean, I think all ambitious people including yourself chrissy can understand um wanting to be successful and i think when i retired from football from when i retired from the nfl as all ex-nfl and all ex-athletes even people you don't even have to be an athlete to understand this if you, if you did if you have done something for a long time and been really good at it and then you stop doing it there's a certain level of depression that sets in 
um, because it's a chemical imbalance now in your brain. Um, Scientists have actually studied this and they call it flow. You create this chemical that they call flow when you're able to do something, repeat something really well for a long time. And then when you stop doing that, so you can be a mountain biker, a mountain climber. And if they take that away from you and you can't do that one thing that you're good at anymore, you stop making that chemical. So all athletes deal with this. And the sooner you can replace that one thing with something else you can become passionate about, the, the, the better off you are. Um, so that's why they always talk about when you retire, pick up a hobby or something like that, right? Um, so for me, business was that new thing that I could compete in and learn to be passionate about and learn to be competitive about. It never fully filled the competitive sports void in, in my heart. But it was something that got me up in the morning and got me in a routine because a lot of people fall by the wayside when they stop their daily routines. Um, So business was that new competition in my life. It was a thing that I needed to and wanted to be great at. Um, And it doesn't always work that way. And a lot of times, especially athletes who have experienced success in their life, um, now you become an entrepreneur and be, being an entrepreneur is tough. And I've failed multiple times at businesses. Um, and I finally got to a business where I'm experiencing success. Um, and I wouldn't change any of it, any of it. I wouldn't change any of the failures prior to this because sometimes you got to learn how to fail to learn how to win type thing. Um, because it's in those failures that you learn to, to take detours and you learn how to handle situations better. And I think that's what's got got me to this point here. Learn how to deal with employees better. Learn how to deal with business partners better. Um, and more importantly, sometimes you just need to be older. So you 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 can you can look at things holistically and and be be better at it. So that's where I'm in life right now with my company rares. You know, it's been a long journey, and I finally feel like I'm in a position where the the game has slowed down to me now. Um it used to be the football game slowed down. Now it's the entrepreneurial game. Yeah. Well, tell us more about that. Is that your logo right behind you? Uh, it's not, but this is one of the shoes that my company owns. So what my company is, my company is rares.io, R-A-R-E-S dot I-O. And what we created was a, the true a first true SEC regulated stock market for sneakers. So essentially we deal with high value uh, appreciation. <laughs> um And basically, the sneakers that we deal with have a high chance of appreciating. So just like people invest in stocks with the hopes that that stock will increase in value um, at a higher rate than the the price that they invest in it, we allow them to invest in fractional ownership in high-value sneakers. In fact, we own the world's most valuable sneaker, uh, which is a $1.8 million sneaker that Kanye... Or um, at the 2000 <laughs> Grammy Awards, um, but there's a lot around that sneaker that makes it so valuable. But we essentially purchased that sneaker, my company, and we split it into to 72,000 shares, real shares, um, and we allow people to invest in that sneaker, or buy shares for $25 a share in that shoe, with the hopes that those shares will increase to a higher value than $25 once we liquidate that shoe. So it's all about finance and fractional investing. Um, in, in fact, that is what my company does. We allow people to invest in alternative assets. It just so happens the alternative assets we deal with is high value sneakers. Um, and, you know, we're, we're the leader in the market in that. And we've been only been around for a year and a half. And I think we're on an upward trend right now. I mean, it's it sounds amazing. And, and it gives people of all walks of life, no matter where they are financially, an opportunity to well, invest you hit, and- you hit it on the head opportunity access and opportunity one most people would never have access to these type of sneakers um but the second part is the opportunity to invest um in a in an appreciating asset class um that that you can invest in for as little as five dollars a share most people on our platform have never invested in a real security before so why not uh, make the first security they invest in something they're familiar with, which is a sneaker, a, a, a high value sneaker. So financial literacy is a big component of what we do. We want to educate people, not only provide the actual marketplace that allows them to invest, um, 
but educate them on why they're investing or how to become better at investing so they can go on to more complex um, type of investments after they leave our platform. But it's our biggest thing is solving the chasm of access and opportunity, especially for lower income uh, cultures and communities. And in the case of sneakers, we're the community, the low income cultures and communities that actually made the sneaker industry popular and valuable. Now we're giving them a chance to now reap the, the secondary financial gain or benefit of that industry as well. That's incredible. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and what gave you the idea? What inspired you? I mean, I think I know, but I want you to share it with us. Oh, well, I've always wanted to be a sneaker. <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't afford sneakers growing up. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, when I was at Harvard, I was going to class and someone stepped on a pair of my Jordan 11s. And I remember it was an accident. And I remember wiping them off and, thinking, you know, there's got to be a better way to derive value out of these appreciating sneakers. Because I knew at the time that sneakers, from a, a return on investment standpoint, were outpacing gold. We're outpacing the S&P 500 um, and even Apple stock. So if you can somehow create a marketplace and turn these into an actual security, you, you had something. Um, so right then I thought about, well, what if you can create a stock market for sneakers? So at the time that wasn't legally possible. Um, so I kind of set on the idea. And once it became something that was, they changed the, the laws and regulations around the Jobs Act, this was possible. So now you can turn a sneaker into an actual security and allow people to own fractional ownership in it. And that's what my company did. And we were, we were the first for, for sneakers and we're the biggest for sneakers. Yeah. And you won an award recently, haven't you? Yeah, we were actually for fractional investment platform platform of the year. We we're finalists uh, between it's, it's my company rares and two other companies and the cool thing about that, those other two companies have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and we haven't raised nearly that much, but yet we're still competing with them because in my opinion, um, we're very authentic about what we do and the asset class we, we do it in. And we touch the culture and we provided a benefit to the culture, a real benefit. And we also speak to the culture in layman's terms. We don't speak over people's heads. Uh, we meet people where they are um, from an educational standpoint and bring them up to where they want to be. So I think the industry has taken note of that and, and rewarded us um, with this nomination. So we're happy about it. That's amazing. It's, I mean, I bet it's that much sweeter since of other, you know, the other businesses that you struggled with to get where you are today. Yeah, it, it is. It, it really is. Um, but it, Chrissy, you know me. And like I mentioned, everything happens for a reason, you know, um, you may not understand why it's happening in the moment. Um, you know, and that's normal, but when you really think back on your life and you think about moments in life or <clears throat> failures in life, you know, everything had to happen to get to a certain point. Um, and for me, I'm at a point now where I'm able to look back at those failures and, and really pinpoint what I've learned from those failures. Cause I never let a failure go by without, dissecting it and being like how can i've done how could i've done this better so if it comes around again I, I know how to make a better decision this time and you know i really took account of those first two companies and i use a lot of those principles um to 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 be better at what i'm doing now now i'm still in it you know we're still raising money and we're still struggling and competing which i love which wakes me up in the morning so we we, we haven't finished yet but you know, I, I think I'm better off from those failures than I would that I than I would have been if I didn't fail before. Whew, that's such a, a amazing because um, I know even you know your stories you tell me as a child when you were, had an obstacle of any sort, whether it's the, the the food stamps or whatever, you immediately went inside and said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna glean some wisdom from this. What can I yep. gain?" And it motivated you intrinsically even more. You yep. know, so that's one message that I would love for everyone uh, watching or listening to really to, you know, to allow that to do that, to not give up when you lose. Yeah. I mean, it propels you to something even greater, don't you think? Yeah, you know, and I, and I don't want to be cliche, but, you know, Jay Z, the great businessman, the great musician, the great, a lot of different <laughs> things, you know, 
he said it best. He said the genius thing was we didn't quit. And it's very simplistic. But a lot of people don't understand that most people will quit around you before they get to the finish line. So even if no matter what you're going through, if you weather the storm and you keep going, most people will quit before they get to the end. And all you have to do is finish to be the winner. And I think that's so profound. Like, you know, life is hard. You know, there's, there's no there's no sugarcoating that. Life is hard and it's harder for some people. Some people start off harder. But the, the thing is, if you find something you're passionate about, you know, don't stop. As entrepreneurs, we sometimes find ourselves in a dark tunnel and we don't know where the light is, right? Because it's dark, nothing's going right, no one's supporting you. You you feel like you can't support you. And more importantly, you don't know where that which way to go because there's nothing lighting your way. And the one thing that I've always learned is at a certain point, you got to light your own tunnel. Everything that's within you, you have to ignite to create that internal light, that combustible light from within you to be the glow to light your way. Because sometimes it's not going to come. No one's going to come to save you sometimes. So whatever you have, all the experiences you had inside, you have to use that to light your own self out up from the inside out to glow yourself through that tunnel. And for me, that was something that I needed to do. And it was hard, but I ended up doing that. And I think that's the hardest part is, is figuring out a way to light your own tunnel. And you, and you get just enough light to find that light at the end. And now you have your North Star. So to all the entrepreneurs and all the people listening to this, you know, sometimes you're closer than you think you are. You know, you've gone through hell and, you know, you, you're struggling and you're tired and, you know, you're irritated. But if you keep going, if you're really passionate about it and you really believe in it, and if you keep going, there will be light. There will be some reward at the end. So that's just a, a, an honest truth about it. Yeah, you're, you're a living example of that. And uh, thank you for sharing that pearl of wisdom and, and, and pearls, <laughs> plural. Yeah. Um, because often I've noticed, you know, in coaching that people are inches away from the finish line when they want to give up. You know, they yep. don't realize how close they are, you know? Yep. Yeah, um, it's tough. It's tough, especially when you've been tough. for a long time. And, you know, we talk about it sometimes, Chrissy, especially when you feel like no one's supporting you. And, you know, I've been I've been there, you know, uh, with this new venture. I was told no 87 times. And, you know, I just filed for bankruptcy from my old venture. And it was like, something's got to give here, right? <laughs> no one was, it was, I felt like no one was listening to me. You know, and I knew I had a good idea. So at a certain point I said, well, let me stop pitching this to people who aren't receiving it and let me let me do something myself and i saved up for two years to 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 build a prototype um because like i said i was told no 87 times and no one understood it because it wasn't not, there was nothing like it um but the biggest point of that is i didn't quit i believed in something so much that i was willing to risk everything you know for it and and <clears throat> And here I am now with this company. But as a microcosm to everyone, we all have our own passions. We all have our own beliefs in, in something that we enjoy. And if you choose to make a business around it, just don't quit on it. You know, just don't quit. Wow. 87 times people said no to you. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. That is wild. Well, yeah. You're, yeah. you're a wonderful example for the rest of us. Jerome, yeah. and we're going to all talk about your business everywhere, right, everybody? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll support you. You'll have to teach us how to do that. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, anything else you want to share before you go into your shout, shout out of your dear friend? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the messages you and I talk about is really everyone being a, a, an insightful player. You know, in our own lives, we can all inspire others by what we do and how we do it and how we treat people. So I just want to echo that message that you don't have to be famous. You don't have to be this. You don't have to be that. You can be who you are, but just be the best of who you are. And, you know, Chris, as we talked about, lead with love and empathy right. and honesty, and the world will be a better place. You know, I think so many people 
want to cut corners or take shortcuts and in taking those shortcuts, they're not honest. You know, they're not hundred percent genuine with other people and themselves. And I think the world is reflecting that right now, whether it be through politics, through our daily interactions with people. But if we all just lead with love and empathy, we can all be our own insightful player in our own lives and amplify that message that you started so brilliantly back in 2010, you know? So that's one thing that I wanted to say. Well, thank you. And you're right. We all can be insightful players for sure. And, um, you know, so anyone who's watching or listening, because it goes to many platforms, um, if you have any insightful players in your life that you know, people that are doing great things to help transform our culture, to be more inclusive, kinder, more loving, reach out. We'd love to have them on. So this is, yes, we're starting off with our wonderful insightful players. Um, there are NFL players, other athletes, and we want everyday people to be part of this too. So please reach out. We want to hear your story. We want to, to spread this like wildfire, just to pour more love into the world. And um, it Jerome's doing a lot of that for sure. Um, so he has a shout out. And um, after he gives his shout out to one of his dear friends, um, Nate Boyer, um, I'm going to, I'm going to conclude with reading a few of his guiding principles from my book. Yeah. So, so why don't um, you tell us about Nate? Yes. Yeah, so I just want to shout out Nate Boyer, who's a former um, army ranger and actually former NFL player. Um, and he was a co-founder of merging vets and players a charity that brings together ex-combat veterans and ex-professional athletes as kind of a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring group. When you think about veterans and athletes, most people are like, well, what do they have in common? But in fact, they have a lot in common. Um, very type A personalities. Typically, the military took them where sports took the other half. But we, a lot of times, come from the same neighborhood, same backgrounds, um, same dysfunction sometimes. So, um the key thing is, though, when we both take off our respective uniforms, we sometimes have the same uh, mental health issues be because no we no longer have missions in life anymore. Um, we no longer wake up with a goal in mind every day. And as I talked about at the top of the show, sometimes that messes with people in different ways. Um, so this charity brings those groups together and allows them to really interact and, and learn from one another and grow from one another and more importantly, help one another. And there's a movie coming out about it. Uh, Sylvester Stallone is one of the producers. Um, Nate Boyer, as I just mentioned, one of the co-founders is actually starring in the film as himself. Um, and I just want you guys to, to look out for that film. It's called MVP, which stands for Merging Vets and Players. Yep. You guys are doing some beautiful work and you've saved some lives, I understand as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's amazing. There's a theme that runs through all your stories in your life is authenticity. You know, yep. you're being so true to the best of who you are. You know, yep. you lead yep. a values driven life. Um, so yep. thank you, uh, Jerome. Thank and, you. I, and I want people to hear some of your guiding principles um, from my book, Inside yep. the Clip. Um, and Jerome talks about use other people's differences as a learning opportunity, as a learning opportunity. I just want to stress that. Find out why they see things the way they do. Get really curious, you know, so you can understand. In fact, go beyond curious. Get fascinated, you know, so they can feel heard and valued. And you can get into some uh, very interesting conversations for sure. And, and don't take ignorant comments from others to heart, you know. Um, don't, don't judge them. Let that fall off of you. And as Jerome did um, back at, at school at Notre Dame, he just he realized they didn't know better. They didn't have the experience. Go out and educate them instead. That's a very powerful message, Jerome. And don't judge others. And don't judge yourself too harshly either. Judgment is really a killer, right? It does a number on all of us, you know? Um, so... Thank you so much. Love having you. Love being reconnected with you, Jerome. You touched my heart Thank very deeply. And Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks for thanks for writing the book and having me back on and you know all the good things that you're doing in the community. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll we'll do some more together for sure. So Absolutely. I want to thank thank everybody for watching or listening and um, go out there and just give a, pour some love into the people in your world, whether it's your family, your neighbors, the grocery clerk, 
and just notice how it lights them up and even lights you up too. So thank you. Until next time. Bye-bye. The entire Insightful Player podcast initiative is dedicated to the late Tom Constantino. Tom Constantino was my PR consultant. He was over the moon fabulous. He was really an exceptional human being and Insightful Player wouldn't have made it to where it is now if it wasn't for Tom. So Tom up there in heaven, I just want you to know you're gonna live in my heart forever and I am forever grateful for you. Thank you.